All right, so this is part one of the lecture video for the chapter Satisfaction Guaranteed. And so let's get started. In this chapter, we really break open the idea of what motivates consumer demand. The ultimate goal of this chapter, in fact, is to build the demand curve and the demand function. But in order to do so, we really want to start with the, the roots of that question. Where does consumer demand come from? Uh, where does it originate? I think in 2020, this question may lose some significance to a lot of people because the idea of consumerism and the idea of consumption is so embedded in our daily lives. But the impetus or the actual incentive structure of what drives individuals to consume is in fact a very interesting question and a very important one as well, especially when it comes time to think about policies that relate to you know, consumptive issues like cigarette taxation or regulating alcohol drinking, whatever the case may be, it's really important for us to understand where consumption comes from in order to understand whether policies will in fact be incentive compatible, that is whether they will actually work. Oftentimes in policies, you'll find that rule makers will ignore, you know, what we actually understand about human behavior when they set policies. And that of course is gonna make those policies a lot less efficient. The origination of the utility function, which is one of the core components of economic thought and what is presented in this particular chapter uh, came from the utilitarians, James Mill, Jeremy Bentham, and then James Mill's son, John Stuart Mill, who wrote one of the most famous uh, 19th century philosophy books, Utilitarianism, in which he really laid out, you know, his idea of how and why people consume, or really how and why people behave. And what sprung forth from his ideas was a formalization of a concept of satisfaction, a formalization of a concept of happiness, what economists refer to as utility. So a lot of what we will talk about in this chapter is these ideas of what drives human consumption and that is gonna be their search for satisfaction. Before we get there, let's spend a little bit of time, you know, sort of laying out the 30,000 foot view of what we're looking at. So the concept of social welfare is a concept that shows up in political science, shows up in sociology, it certainly shows up in economics. And the idea behind social welfare is that it becomes a way for us to measure some notion of human prosperity uh, within a given society. Usually we think about social welfare as being a country level idea. What is the level of social welfare in say the United States, for example? But the truth is, is that social welfare is a very nebulous term uh, what I consider social welfare may not necessarily be what someone else considers social welfare. And this is highly problematic in democratic uh, situations when we hope that consensus driven policy will lead to uh, the best potential outcomes. If everyone in society has their own definition of social welfare, which oftentimes we do, this is one of the barriers to social progress, if you will. So a lot of what economists have uh, sought to do is to unify this idea of social welfare around some central idea. Uh, and that's uh, what we'll do in this chapter as well. We will ultimately discuss what we call the utility, utility function in economics. And you can think about the social welfare function as being an accumulation of each individual utility function uh, in the economic system or in society writ large. Um, and we have sort of several different ways in which we can think about a social welfare function. We can think about it from a purely utilitarian perspective as we see here on, on the slide, where we're simply taking everyone's happiness and we're adding it up. And if you can imagine we were able to quantify everyone's happiness and we just added up everyone's, let's call it happiness score, then that would be a measure of social welfare. And then as a goal or a policy goal, we could say that we wanna maximize social welfare. And then this gives us a framework, it gives us a path forward as to how we might design policy, uh, you know, other sort of uh, social, social habits. You know, if you think about all of the ways in which we behave, you know, holding doors open for people, this is certainly isn't codified in law, uh, but we do it anyway, right? There's a social 
benefit uh, to holding doors open for people. So we engage in that behavior regardless of whether we're compensated for it um, or not. We can also think about the social welfare function as a social utilitarian social welfare function and this function, instead of just individual happiness, we also derive happiness from others' happiness. So if you can imagine that we each have happiness functions, again, later we'll call these utility functions, and imagine in a social utilitarian view, each of us cares about our own happiness, but we also care about uh, everyone else's happiness. Um, you can imagine that this util uh, social welfare function is distinct from a purely utilitarian one, and therefore the policy prescriptions under this function would be different than the other one. So if, if there is some level of altruism in your society, you might have a different set of preferred policies than if you exist in a society where everyone is simply rationally self-interested. And this, this, by the way, this social utilitarian uh, function is what a lot of economists believe to be closer to the true social welfare function. It's clearly the case that there are some of us that are just rationally self-interested. Uh, we might call those individuals selfish uh, or greedy. Um, but then of course there are more people, uh, I think, who also care about others' happiness. Now maybe you only care about your friends and your family's happiness, but I do think that there are a number of us uh, who also care about other people's happiness. And, and so those societies may, uh, you know, when they maximize their social welfare functions, the policies and the social norms that they generate may be, may be distinct. We see this, of course, uh, just in the context of, you know, regional differences in day-to-day in -day life. You know, the behaviors in a place like New York City are very distinct from the behaviors in the small towns of the Southern United States, in part because we in those regions tend to have different social welfare functions. A more sort of social view, a uh, purely social view would be like a Rawlsian social welfare function. Uh, this was named after the uh, philosopher John Rawls, very underappreciated in the modern context. Um, his idea was that let's think about the social welfare function as inherently being valued at the least uh, well-off individual. So if we imagine that instead of defining social welfare as an accumulation of everyone's happiness, what if we just define social welfare as being the uh, happiness of the least happy person? So the idea there is that if you maximize social welfare in that context, you are ensuring that your policies and the cultural norms that you create are, you know, by definition, helping the least um, among you, the, 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 the folks who have the least means um, uh, to help themselves. Um, so obviously this is a, a social welfare function which would, you know, favor things like large social safety nets, um, you know, universal health care, you know, policies which really seek to improve the livelihoods of those who tend to be on the low income of the uh, income spectrum. Um, to this end, uh, the way that we usually think about this is that the, the uh, association of a social welfare function is really, again, this democratic process that ends in the formation of a social contract. Uh, whether this social contract is written down, like, say, the U.S. Constitution, uh, and then edited over time to reflect society's evolving views of social welfare, or whether the social contract is merely uh, an unspoken agreement amongst a group of individuals, we can think about the social contract as being the agreement, uh, whether this is a, a majority rule agreement or whatever the agreement is, on how society is gonna think about their social welfare function, how society is going to think about the success or lack of success of the policies and the, and, the, and the sort of social norms that are generated within their social context. I think a really good explanation for what we mean by the social contract is uh, embodied um, in this video here. So let me. <laughs> hey, actually, I, I was waiting. Well, I didn't see you. I've been standing here for the last 10 minutes. I won't be long. Um, that's not the point. The point is, I was here first. Well, if you were here first, you'd be holding the phone. <laughs> you know, we're living in a society. We're supposed to act in a civilized way. 
<laughs> Does she care? No. Does anyone ever display the slightest sensitivity over the problems of a fellow individual? No. No. A resounding no. Hey, sorry I took so long. Oh, that's okay, really. Don't worry. <laughs> so that's one of my uh, uh, you know, favorite um, Seinfeld clips, but also um, I think you know fairly instructive to you know what I mean when I talk about this idea of the social contract. You know, in the scene, George has this notion of who's next in line to use the public phone. He's been there. He's been waiting. He steps away. Uh, the woman walks up, takes his place in line, and to her, I mean, to him, she's violated this social contract. You know, he was there first. He should be the one who can use the the phone. She rejects his view of the social contract. Now, someone might argue, well, he stepped away, right? So maybe your social contract is if he steps away, you know, sort of finders keepers, losers weepers, you know, those sorts of things. But anyway, I think this is just, I think, a nice way to encapsulate both the, the sort of straightforward nature of the social contract, but at the same time, the dirty process of how we actually get there, right? Actually forming a cohesive social contract that everyone abides by is extremely difficult, bordering on impossible. To sort of further elaborate on this, um, in the early 20th century, uh, during what we call the so-called marginal revolution in economics, there were economists who sort of think about how we might formalize this idea of, again, maximizing social welfare. And the economist, uh, Pareto comes along and he establishes what you see here, which is called the Pareto frontier. Uh, here, this is a simple two person model. We have two individuals um, and we're just going to simply consider their happiness. Uh, and uh, as we you know, increase uh, to the um, right on the horizontal axis, that increases uh, Omer's happiness. And as we uh, move vertically along the y axis, we see an increase in Christina's happiness. And, and the frontier itself is representative of the maximal position that society, if it's using all of its resources efficiently, efficiently this is where um, society could potentially end up. Again, we call this the Pareto frontier. So the goal of society would be to uh, be on the frontier itself. Now, what's interesting about the Pareto frontier is that you can be on the frontier, uh, say at points B and C, but as you see points B and C, those are completely unequal. In both the circumstance, you have one individual being maximally happy and the other individual essentially getting zero happiness. Um, this is technically efficient because it's on the Pareto frontier, but of course it's grossly unequal. So I like to point this out because again, in search of this conversation about the social contract, one of the big conversations we have is the so-called efficiency equity trade-off. And this idea that we can go and try to maximize economic efficiency. But if we do that, we may unfortunately end up at a point like B or C in which one person is extremely happy and someone is little to uh, no happiness whatsoever. In the context of the Pareto frontier, what we're seeking is so-called Pareto improvements. So suppose we're at point A uh, notice point A is not on the frontier, so we are inefficient. That is that we're not using the resources of society in an efficient manner. And so we want to move. We want to move to a new position. You can think about moving to the new position being a policy, right? And, and we want to pick a policy that moves us to the frontier, but does so in a particular way, in, in a way that we call a Pareto improvement. And a Pareto improvement simply means that you make uh, at least one person happier without making any other one person less happy, right? So again, you make one person happy without making anyone else happy. That's called a Pareto improvement. And in a sense, this is the way that economists tend to think about policy. We want policies to seek social improvement, but we also want policies that seek that improvement in a way that would be considered uh, a Pareto improvement. Again, that is helping one individual without uh, you know, making one person uh, worse off. At the same time, um, you know, our goals are generally going to be, uh, you know, from a rational perspective, to try to get towards the middle of the Pareto frontier. That is where individuals have generally um, the same level of happiness or at least have access uh, to the same level of happiness. And again, this is the way that economists tend to frame these issues. And then this aids us 
as we go on to develop, uh, you know, notions of how society uh, is going to grapple with uh, both the, um, you know, uh, inputs of the economic system as well as the outcomes uh, of the economic system. And to this end, we want to introduce uh, the two fundamental welfare theorems of economics. These are crucially important as a sort of um, academic touchstone uh, to how we think about economic systems. Uh, the first fundamental welfare theorem basically says that competitive markets, what we might call free markets, uh, maximize economic efficiency. So if your goal as society is to maximize purely economic efficiency, what the first fundamental welfare theorem tells us is that free markets, and, and, and specifically freely competitive markets, you can't say free market without competitive markets because if we have a situation where we have market power, then this tends to reduce social welfare. We'll cover this in a later chapter, but for the time being, suffice it to say that when we say free market, really what we mean is a competitive market. Uh, this is a market in which none of the firms inside of it uh, have any sort of market power. In those markets, uh, we find that the markets themselves do a really good job of distributing the goods and services in an economic system. And again, so this is kind of where you get that laissez-faire view, that free market view of economic systems, which is that competitive markets maximize economic efficiency. We will, throughout the course, reject the first fundamental welfare theorem in those circumstances where it is, you know, easily uh, rejected. We just talked about the equity efficiency trade-off. So again, this is sort of a part of that embedded component of the social contract. Uh, we can kind of maximize the economic growth of, of an economy, but if we do so, we may uh, create a, a host of uh, economic inequities. Um, and then the concern is, is that eventually those economic inequities are gonna actually curtail the economy's ability to grow into the future. This is a central concern we have right now in 2020, where we have, you know, experienced a, a tremendous, you know, multi-decade economic boom. But if you look at it in specifically the United States, we have as bad of income inequality as we did uh, in the late 1800s. Again, a time period where people signaled uh, their willingness to, you know, reduce that level of income inequality uh, through policies and, and through things like the social safety net, which then, of course, went on and, and were at least partially responsible for things like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We can kind of look at those policies, those social safety net policies, as a recognition by policymakers of this efficiency equity trade-off. If you're gonna have a really quickly growing economy, you, you need to have policies that are there, again, to kind of smooth over uh, the rougher edges of capitalism. And then uh, as equally as important as the first fundamental welfare theorem, we have the second uh, fundamental welfare theorem. This says that any Pareto efficient position can be redistributed to another Pareto efficient position. So if we have an, an unequal position, what the second theorem tells us is that all it takes is some redistribution and we can improve that position. So if we go back and let's say that we happen to be at point B where Christina gets everything and Omer gets nothing, what the second fundamental welfare theorem tells us is that we can always move in this direction through redistribution. Here, the easiest way is to have Christina compensate Omar for his lack of happiness. And, and, and again, we could look at the policy goal, perhaps, of point D. Maybe we don't get there. Maybe we only get to point F. But at least point F, from Omar's perspective, is certainly preferable to point B. And we also see that point F still leaves Christina uh, very happy as well. So you can think about, you know, moving from, you know, B to D so being something like, uh, you know, the U.S. creating uh, the Medicaid program, which specifically uh, tries to help low-income individuals who don't have insurance through a, an employer, helps them, you know, have access to health care services, helps them pay their health care bills. So you can imagine moving from point B to D, in part, would be a policy like Medicaid. 